So it's a wonderful to see you tonight. Glad that you're here. In just a few weeks, we're going to be doing Reformation Celebration on Wednesday night. So you all kind of be getting ready for that. We're going to have a good time. They are, I think that they, did you guys meet today about the hogs? Or when is that? Okay, they met today about the hogs. So we're picking out some pretty hogs. We're going to kill them. We're going to eat them. So um, we're going to have a great time. Seriously, we are, we are, we are doing a huge hog roast. And uh, why? Because they do hog roast in the Reformation time period. So uh, anyways, uh, uh, Martin Luther was considered a wild boar in the vineyard, tearing up the vineyard um, of the Pope. And so uh, anyways, we are excited about uh, Reformation celebration. I want to encourage you to be looking forward to that. Um, I have a few notes here for you. First of all, check this out. We have 10 tickets for the, ga- for the, the SHCS gala left, and they are 10 available tonight. If you want to, Marcy has them right there. If you want to buy a ticket tonight, you can do that. It is a fundraiser. We're tr- seeking to raise funds um, for our wonderful school, and so I want to encourage you with that. It's for a good cause. Maybe you can't go, but you'd like to pay for somebody to go. Go up and buy a ticket, and Marcy will give the ticket to somebody, or maybe you want to give the ticket to someone. You can do that tonight, but it's going to be worth it. It's going to be a great time. Um, so that we look forward to that. That's this Friday night. So um, as well, Fall D now, young people, um, Dulos is the name of it. Does anybody know the, what the word Dulos means? What does Dulos mean? Slave. Servant, slave. Excellent. Very good. Um, I heard y'all uh, just right on that. Very good. So we're going to be doing that. So y'all are going to be serving, enslaving. No, um, you're going to be learning how to be a bond servant, how to be a slave of the Lord. It's a good thing. Um, starting point is starting October 20th. Some of you have said, I want to join into the life of this church. How do I do that? First thing you do is just come to starting point. And uh, it's right here in this room. We have a bunch of people already signed up. Um, I teach it, and uh, I'm excited. The Hill family, um, Pastor Hill, and he's going to go through starting point. And if Pastor Hill's got to go through starting point, you've got to go through starting point. So um, if my grandmother had to be baptized, you've got to be baptized. No. Um, so I just want to encourage you, come to Starting Point, sign up for that before you leave tonight um, as we kind of get going. So um, I don't know, you guys don't have that website ready, do you, um, right now, it, Bernita? I think afterwards we're going to do that, so if we have a minute. But um, the Walk for Life is co- right around the corner. You can, uh, you can get one of these things and raise some uh, funds for that. We have um, a bunch of people already signed up to do it. Bernita is in second place right now. I don't know who's in first place, but uh, Ricardo and Bernice LaMata are uh, also there, uh, several others. But anyways, I want to encourage you um, to do the Walk for Life. It is a blast. Young people, it's a lot of fun. You shouldn't miss it. It's a great time. So let's pray. Let's all stand together and pray, and then we're going to let these young people run out of here. Miss Faye, you better find a spot because these young people are going to run you over. So um, let's pray together before we jump into God's Word and before you guys take off. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we can sing about your kingdom coming and your will being done, and let everyone know um, of who you are and what you've done. Thank you that you're the good king that's coming back for his people. And Lord, I I do thank you tonight that we can say, Lord, whatever the test, um, that your will would be done. Would you do that in us? Lord, thank you for reviving our hearts this evening, reminding us of the truth that you're with us in the good times and in the bad. Lord, we know that there's many needs in our fellowship, even represented here tonight. Um, We know that there's folks that are struggling with various concerns, either health or great struggles financially or vocational. I think about the people in our church that need jobs and uh, that need to change a job um, because of various reasons. Lord, I, I just pray that you would be working and moving in every need in our, in, our, in our church. Lord, I think about Mr. Fillmore, 94 years old and out at Memorial West tonight with the infection in his hand, and um, just, uh, Lord, how we pray that you would be with him in a special way tonight. We pray that you'd lift up his heart. Lord, we pray that he would find your encouragement there, even in that hospital room as he's alone tonight. I pray that you would be with him in a very um, a very powerful, powerful way, a very powerful sense, Lord, that he knows that you are with him. Lord, thank you for his faith in you. And, uh, Lord, we do pray for the many others like him that just need your touch and your encouragement tonight. Thank you for our young people, Lord, that they're going to study the Bible. Thank you that they're here tonight after a busy day of school. 
how I pray that you would just, re, just really be um, raising them up to be the next generation of those who love you on this earth. So, Lord, thank you for them. And uh, be with us all as we study your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. So, young people, quietly take off, quietly run, and uh, get straight up there so you can get in the word. And for everybody else, do you have an outline? If you don't have an outline, we have some guys that have outlines. Mr. Mahler has one, and I think Danny Simu has some. Uh, if you don't have an outline, please lift your hand and they will get them to you. Tonight we are doing really a part two of the return of Christ. And um, I understand that there's something sweet to eat afterwards, so we'll do that before the young people get back in here. Ha ha. So um, as they all turn around and look at me. Um, but last week, let's, let's remember, as we are looking at heaven, hell, and the end of the world... One of the key issues, one of the key issues that we want to re- recognize and remember is the return of Christ. And there's a lot of questions about the return of Christ. There's a lot of things that um, a, lot of, a lot has been said. Many books have been written. Um, now that the young people are out of the room, I can say, if you want to see a lot of people show up at church, you talk about the return of Christ, or you preach on sex, um, uh, before this study is all over, we will talk about... Um, actually the return of Christ and sex and the glorified state of God's plan. And you're going, oh my gosh, where's that going? That's not tonight. At a later time, it'll be there. Um, But it all fits together. You go, really? Yeah, it really does. So you'll see in a little while, um, you'll see. That's just a bit of a teaser for later times. Now you're all going to be wondering what week that's going to be. But you just keep coming and you'll see. Um, (laughs) But we've been, we were looking at the return of Christ last week, and let's review a little bit. If you have notes, you can review. Um, if you don't have the notes except for tonight, then you're just going to have to look at the screen. So, guys, let's kind of blow through these really quickly with this. So go ahead, Michael. Um, what we know um, concerning the return of Christ is this. Let's read them out loud together. Number one, he is coming back. That was very few of you. Let's read the one. What is it? He is coming back. His coming will be what? His coming will be what? Visible is the next one. His coming will be, what's the next one? Personal. Personal, And his coming will be what? The first time he came, how? Say it again. As a baby in a manger. Was he born into a palace? No. Was he born into Greece? I mean, Athens. Was he born into Rome? No. Was he born into Washington, D.C., power center? No. He was born into a little town called Bethlehem on the outskirts of Jerusalem, which was the capital of a city of people that were basically rejected by the world and are still rejected by the world in many, many cases, in many ways. So this baby comes into the world, God's glorious plan, in showing his humility and his glorious plan. Notice this, though. When he comes again, he is going to come riding not um, in, a, in a manger, but he's going to come riding on the clouds. And look what it says there. It says, and just as is appointed for man once to die or to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save. What does it say? Let's read it out loud, the blue words. Those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is a key theme throughout the New Testament, that we would eagerly wait on on him. Now, key theme throughout the Old Testament was eagerly wait on him the first time. That was, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. They were looking for the Messiah, right? We are very similar to that. We are just looking for him to come the second time. Can you say amen? Amen. That's, That's the plan, all right? Let's go on. Keep going, guys. Um, What we don't know about the return of Christ are these things, as in the first red statement there is, what signs have been fulfilled? We know that there's signs. Jesus talked about signs. We see in the Old Testament there's signs. Here are some ones that we, we, we don't know exactly everything about each one of these. One is the, the thing that, that, the sign that says, there's going to be preaching to all nations. Well, what does that exactly mean? Is that all geopolitical nations? Well, we don't think so. Is that all ethnos, all groups of people? Um, probably. When will that occur? We, we, we're not sure. The Great Tribulation. When exactly is the Great Tribulation? Some would have said that it was 70 AD. Some would have said that it was 275. Some would say it was during the 
um, the Middle Ages. Some would say, I mean, there was, there was different people throughout time seeking to map out what is the Great Tribulation. And if you were alive during, if you were, if you were a true Christian in Germany or in Europe during World War II, you would say, well, this must be the Great Tribulation. This might, I mean, there's, there's people through every age that have wondered, what, it, what is this exactly? So we take hints from it, we see it, but we don't know exactly what the Great Tribulation um, will be, though there are some indicators about it. We know that it's going to be tremendously terrible. Um, false prophets and miracle workers. Well, there's been false prophets and miracle workers for 2,000 years. Um, it does seem to think that there, it does seem to say that there's going to be much more of that just re- before the return of Christ. We believe that that's true. Signs in the heavens. That means that like even celestial beings and things with the moon and the sun and uh, the atmosphere around us, there's, there's interpretations there. We talked about last time that there were some people, that, there were Christians in the Middle East that would say, well, does this apply um, to, to all of the massive problems that came as a result of the Gulf War and even setting all the oil wells on fire throughout um, Iraq and through Syria and various places that it's created um, circumstances that some would say, could this in fact be the closing of the, I mean, the, the covering of the earth, the, the shrouding of the moon, the shrouding of the sun that would be, have indicated that at the time when that was happening. Some were declaring that that was the case very boldly, saying that that was the case on television and everything else. We, we just say there's questions there that we don't, we don't exactly know what all of these mean. The second coming of the, or excuse me, the coming of the Antichrist. Um, and there's much that we talked about last week on that. Today, the first one is, for your blank there at the top, is the salvation of Israel. What exactly does the salvation of Israel mean? This is part of it. It's interesting that today is Yom Kippur. We have been celebrating that in, here in South Florida, as you see Jewish people all around the world, uh, all around the world and all around South Florida, perhaps in your neighborhood, going to, to their synagogue. Um, Yom Kippur, Yom means day, Kippur means atonement. So today is the day of atonement recognized by Jewish people. Um, this is based in Leviticus and Exodus where we see the, the great day set aside for fasting and for the recognition of the great sacrifice for the year for the salvation, excuse me, for the forgiveness of sins. And so Jews today um, have been fasting from sundown yesterday to um, today, and this is a time of recognizing um, the, the final sacrifice, or excuse me, their sacrifice, we would say uh, the final sacrifice of Christ. If we were going to see, assign value to today, it would be recognizing that this was the picture of the great sacrifice of God through Christ Jesus. Um, so we see... Um, Israel all around us. We see Israel all around the world, the people um, in that sense of that ethnicity and that belief system. Um, The salvation of Israel. When will these people become um, considered coming into uh, the salvation of God? So this is, this is a great question that uh, is surrounding this because we see it prophesied that something big is going to happen um, with what we call Israel. So let's look at this. Look at Romans 11, verses 11 through 12. It says, So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, though through their trespass salvation has come to the Gentiles as, so as to make Israel jealous Now, look at this. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, underline it, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So there's, it looks like there's going to be a full inclusion um, of this people of God that we see there. Look at a few verses later in verses 25 through 27, lest you be wise in your own side, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Wow. All Israel will be saved. What does that mean? As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, there are wild statements that have been made over these verses and this concept of Israel being saved. Now, but let's look at this. Amidst the things that we don't know, here are some things that, that we do want to recognize. All Christians believe 
in a future for Israel. Virtually every Christian group, every Christian denomination believes that there is a special future for Israel. It's just that there is disagreement on the identity of Israel. What does Israel mean? What does this, who is this? Is it an ethnic people? Underline the word ethnic there. So is it, is it an ethnicity of Jews? Is it a national state? Now, for a long time, that wasn't thought of, but what happened in 1948? 1948, I mean, there's a bunch of wild stuff that happened um, at the end of World War II, and then at the end of World War II, there, were, there was a dividing up amidst the former Axis powers and, and allied powers, and eventually comes out of all of those wranglings politically a state for the Jews of the world, for Israel. And they were given a legal state during that time. Now, let me tell you, when that happened, the presses started flying with speculation about what all that meant um, for the prophecies of God. And so we, we, we start to see that. There's some people would immediately start forming a grid and passing everything of modern events or even recent modern events through a certain grid of interpretation. We need, we need to be careful about that lest we start to go down some paths that may or may not be scriptural. Look at the next part here. The church, is it, is it ethnic people? Is it a national state? Is it the church? Is that what this is speaking of? The, the people of God being Israel? Or Christ himself? Um, we see in the Old Testament and we see um, in the Psalms that there's, there's the whole picture of God and his people and then we start to see Israel being, there's, there's even phrases where the word Israel is used to refer to the Messiah. Um, so this is what we do know in this. We are heirs of a Jewish promise. However it goes, whatever you think about those four designations to the top, the thing that we do know is that Christians are heirs of a Jewish promise. Romans chapter 4 talks about that. Look at Galatians 3.16. Now the promises are made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And, you, and to you, offspring, who is Christ? Do you see that even, even right there, there could be a question, what, what is exactly does that mean? Does that mean Israel is is uh, the offspring, excuse me, that Christ is the sole offspring that is recognized here in, in speaking of Israel? Or is that referring to the Christ and all who are in Christ? All who are in Christ are receiving that inheritance. Look at the next part there at the uh, bottom of page 38. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for in Christ Jesus. You are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Neither, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all, what does it say, one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to what? Promise. God made the promise to Israel. I mean, excuse me, to Abraham. And as he made that promise to Abraham, we... Paul is very, very clearly telling us in Galatians 3 that we are heirs of that promise. And so this is the picture that he is, he is operating and our blessing of salvation, listen, our blessing of salvation comes through a Jewish promise. Look at Colossians 2, 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. This is talking about a spiritual thing, not physical circumcision, but a spiritual circumcision of having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So we are brought into this covenant with God through the picture and through the work of Christ. Look at Colossians 3.11. Here there is neither Greek nor Jew, and excuse me, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ, look what it says, underline this, Christ is all and in all. And so the promise that our salvation comes from begins in the promise of God to his people, Israel, and that comes 
through Abraham, through the people of Israel to us. So um, this, we are saved by a Jewish promise. We are also saved by a Jewish Messiah, the very one who would go and pay for our sins. It is he who does this. Look at, down at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 through 22. For all of the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So it is a promise that is sealed. And that means it is, it is, all, as, it, it is as if it's already delivered. That's why Jesus would say, it is finished. It is paid in full. And then the Holy Spirit is given to God's people as the evident promise that he has made the promise. He has fulfilled it. He has given himself as a holy God into even our, our sinful flesh. He comes and dwells in us. Why? Because of the promise of his redemption. Very important concept, very big. It's, it's we are passionate about that. Look at the next part. We are passionate about a Jewish mission. You see, God has called us to reach the world, including Jews. There's some who would say, well, Jews, they've already had their chance. The Messiah came through them, and he re- they rejected him. And now the, the gospel goes to Gentiles and is evidenced by how hardened the heart of many Jewish people are that God is not working in the Jews. He is not doing that. He's working in many others. There's some people that would interpret that and say, really, the Jews aren't part of that mission. There are even some Christian groups um, from the Middle Ages right on through to today who have kind of excluded Jews as part of their goal. Because they would say that the Jews, it's not that they're beyond reaching, it's just that this is not God's grand plan right now. I would say that is patently false. God is about saving everyone. And while there are many who may be hardened and very slow to come to faith um, from the Jewish um, uh, tradition and from Jewish faith, there are still Jews getting saved. Uh, we have people in our church that come from a Jewish background, and that Messiah has come and got them, and they believed in him. Um, and so this is an important part of the mission that God still gives us that includes Jews. Look at Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, bottom of page 39. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Listen to Paul's heart for the Jewish people. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So the people like he was born into Judaism, he was born as an ethnic Jew. Here he is saying that I, I wish I could be accursed in their place. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, or the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So it does not sound like the Jews are excluded from salvation, even in this day and time. Amen? I mean, we we are to love them, and pray for them, and they are included in this. So there's much is shrouded in some of these questions, though. What, What does some of this mean? Um, There's another thing that we need to consider as we do this uh, about the second coming. We need to consider, is the second coming just one event or is it two? I know that's a large space there for the word two, but is it just one event or is it two? And depending on um, how you define and how you look at some of these things that we're saying that we, we, we potentially are a little bit unsure of exactly what they mean, there are some who would say, well, there's two events when Christ comes again. And the first one would be saying that first... A secret coming for his church is before the tribulation. So Christ is going to come, boom, there's going to be a sudden um, rapture that you can put out there to the side, the rapture. That's what, that's what the rapture would be about. That boom, suddenly um, God is going to snatch away, take away um, those who, when, when things are about to come, and, the, and many would say, as the great tribulation is about to hit, that God's church is taken out before that event. 
occurs in the true church is saved from that and then great tribulation comes and then after the great tribulation that there would be a second coming of Jesus along with the saints along with those who have ministered all of the church to reign upon the earth that's part of the picture there there's 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 one whole line of thought there's one whole line of prophecy teachers that would say that it's it's really a bit of a of a two stage event of the second coming Others would say, no, it's simply a single event, a single moment where Jesus returns for his church. Um, and there's, there's different views on whether the, the Great Tribulation is before that or after that. But nevertheless, there's, there's a bit of, the, of a question in that. Now, look at this with me. Some have said, well, could Jesus really come back at any time, at any moment? Have the prophecies been fulfilled enough and in, in, perf- in uh, proper fulfillment that he could come at this moment? Have they been fulfilled in that? Um, scripture seems to teach this, that Jesus could come back at any moment. And you can look back through the New Testament, and especially to First and Second Thessalonians, and you see that they were expecting an imminent return of Christ. So the Scripture... Just, just clearly indicates that, that Christians, God's people, are to live um, ready for the return of Christ because it is seen as imminent. It is seen as just before us. Now, one thing that is, and I want you to see some of these that are here. They're very obvious in Philippians 4, and we'll study this in a, in a couple of months. But notice here in Philippians 4, 4 through 7, um, and I'd like to ask somebody to read that. Pastor Jason, do you mind reading that real strong? So Pastor Jason has just read one of my favorite sections of Scripture. That Scripture right there has gotten me through many, many hard times and helped me remember what is true. But look what it says. The Lord is at hand. This is Paul saying, hey, the Lord is near. He is coming. Um, We see also in Titus chapter 2, look what it says in verse 11 through 4. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So he's saying that this is coming. He is coming again. This This is very, very clear. He's coming for his people. Look at Jude chapter 20 in verse 21. But you, beloved, building up yourselves, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who leads to eternal life. That whole idea of waiting upon him, expecting him. Now, the picture from George Ladd, theologian, look what he says here. The prophets who were little interested in chronology in the future was always viewed as imminent. That's in the prophets of the Old Testament. Look at this. The Old Testament prophets blended the near and the distant perspectives so as to form a single canvas. Biblical prophecy is not primarily three-dimensional, but two. It has height and breadth, but it but it is little concerned with depth, i.e. the chronology of the future. The distant, the distant is viewed through the transparency of the immediate. It is true that the early church lived in expectancy of the Lord and in the nature of biblical, biblical prophecy, and it is the nature of biblical prophecy to make it possible for every generation to live in expectancy of the end. So this is, this is just what we see in the Word of God, that every generation has biblical reason to hear the call that Christ is coming and that we are to live as if he's coming now. So what do we do now? In all of this, what do we do? The first thing that we do is we need to trust in the authority of Christ. 
the bottom line is he is coming back. And when he comes back, he is coming to rule and to reign. Look what it says in Matthew 24, 29. Um, it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Remember what we said, what does all that mean? That's, that's part of the sign, that's part of the signs of the heavens. Then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is, we can trust that he is coming. Over and over and over again, the Bible is making this clear. And here's also what we can see. The things of this world, fill this in, the things of this world are passing. They're passing away. They are temporary. But the truth of God's word is permanent. The Bible tells us that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And so his word is true. The thing, your car, your house, your cash, your everything you get, everything you're trying to leave for your kids, everything you have, it, it's, it is simply going to be gone. And it's not going to make it into eternity. But the truth of God's word does. Look at Matthew 24, 35. Let's all read Matthew 24, 35 aloud together. Very precious words from Jesus. Let's read it. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Grass withers, flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Heaven and earth will pass away. I mean, the picture of all of these things will go, but he will not. Look at the next thing. Um, we not only trust in the authority of Christ, we persevere in the power of Christ. Um, we persevere in this. Um, there's many, many references for this, but I want you to see this. Followers of Jesus will face deception. Um, as we come to this, as we come to the return of Christ, there are going to be deceivers. And we talked about that this week, uh, or last week, Matthew 24, Jesus said, he answered them and he said, see that no one leads you astray. Look at Matthew 24, 22. It says, and if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, even those days were cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, he says, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So, he says, see, I have told you beforehand. Now, that's a very good word for us in this day and time. Because it certainly does seem to us that a lot of events in the world are happening very fast over the last 150 years. Things seem to be speeding up in many, many different ways. I don't know. Um, but I think that we need to be aware that there's going to be a great temptation to be deceived. Um, and Jesus warns us of that. Jesus also says this about the coming of this, as we come up on the second coming of Christ, that followers of Jesus will face tribulation. They are going to face tribulation. Um, look at Matthew 24 again. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars so that you will not be able to see that you are not alarmed for this must take place, the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are but the beginning of the birth pang. So this picture of this. Now Christians, it is important for us to recognize that Christians are not saved from trials. When you become a Christian, you don't automatically um, get the exempt card on trials. I mean, I, you, you wish you did, um, but that's simply not the truth. Uh, it's not the way it is. And having more faith um, will not simply exempt you from trials. You know, the name it, claim it group, the whole um, health, wealth, gospel group will say, well, if you have enough faith, you're not going to have great trials. And that simply is not true. We see through the scripture, even going back to the very person of our Lord Jesus Christ, that great in, great in trials, even unto death, um, have come. We see that in the early church. Notice this. Christians are not saved from those trials, but they are saved through trials. Um, this is the great picture. The ultimate salvation that comes to us is through the great trial of Christ. 
not only his trial before Pilate and Herod, but his trial of walking through the shadow of death for us. He comes and he does this. Now, God works great things through the trials in our life. There are many people in our church who have gone through great trials, and some of those people were even saved as a result of a great trial. There was cancer that came upon them, or there was the loss of a child, or there was, I mean, we, we have a family uh, in our church, excuse me, we have three families in our church that because of the loss of a child, their family came to faith in Jesus Christ. And so this, this thing that you, we would all say, well, uh, what, are, what are the top five things that would be the worst that could ever happen to you? I would say we would all say the loss of a child, and there's people in this room that have lost children. Um, but yet God works through even the horror of the loss of a child um, at different times. So God works through tri- trials. He brings us to an understanding of himself through trials. Notice this, the followers of Jesus will also face temptation. So we'll face deception, we'll face tribulation, we will face temptation. Um, that Matthew 24 passage talking about that we, that we um, are tempted to believe false doctrines. We are tempted to follow false prophets. Look at the next one at the top of page 42. Followers of Jesus will face persecution. This is very, very clear. Matthew 24 and verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. That's persecution. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, some of you have said, well, wait a minute. The day y'all led me to Christ, you didn't tell me about that. Um, I, I thought he was going to bring peace into my heart. Well, no, Jesus actually said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And I didn't come um, to deliver you from every single earthly trial, but I did come to deliver you from your sins. And I came to deliver you from that which would take you to hell. Notice the fact of the matter is this, persecution inevitably follows kingdom proclamation. Persecution always follows kingdom proclamation. The bottom line is when you preach the gospel, when you speak the gospel, there is going to be an earthly reaction to that. And the earthly reaction in a fallen world is kickback. We have friends in the Middle East and in North Africa and the Arab world the, in the Muslim world specifically, that when they come to Christ, if they keep their mouth shut, they might make it without very much persecution. But as soon as they start to share that there is a Messiah and he really has died and he will forgive you and he will, this is the spirit of God that will come live within you. If you will turn to him in belief and you will come to see that he died for your sins, if you will believe in him, now, when they start to say things like that, that is when they start to be beaten, that is when they start to be chased, that is when they start to be followed and silenced. Um, but many of them speak boldly the name of Christ. Read the book of Acts. Throughout Acts, we see the proclamation of the gospel and then persecution. Some of you would say this, when I speak the gospel to my family, I am persecuted for that. They laugh at me. They think I'm dumb. They think I'm stupid. Or they think it's funny. Or they get mad. There are people that in our church that have spoken the gospel at work. And some of them that have had great ministry of sharing the gospel without any problem. But you know, persecution is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Denial of Christ by far is the worst thing that can happen to you. The greatest thing is to be in league with God in what He is doing And Jesus said, if they're going to do this to me, then what are they going to do to you? This persecution is not the worst thing that can happen to us. The worst thing that can happen to us is to go into a Christless eternity. Instead, what he's saying, what is great to do is by faith to proclaim the gospel. Now look at the next part. Proclamation inevitably results in kingdom consummation. Put out to the side consummation where it says that bringing together. That's what it means. Um, when a marriage is consummated, the husband and the wife come together, and that's in sexual coitus, that is the consummation of the wedding vow, and they come together. That's to to consummate the marriage. Well, there is a great consummation that is coming. When the gospel is proclaimed to all of the earth, 
the end will come, the consummation will result. Look at this, what it says in Matthew 24, and let's read it out loud together. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Underline that, and the end will come. This is one of the things. We, we, we don't know everything about that. We don't know exactly what all that means, but we know that as that happens, this is what God is going to do and bring about. Now, not only are followers of Jesus going to face persecution, but followers, here, here is, here's the next section of points here. We anticipate the coming of Christ. So not only do we persevere in the power of Christ, but we also anticipate the coming of Jesus. We are to be expectant. Um, may it be on our hearts. It's kind of like this. Um, I think about Derek and Cammy, and they recently had grace. Um, I think about um, Indy and Pastor Lucas, and they've had little Boaz. And there's several others there. Look at Luce and Ray um, with, the ba- with the birth of their baby. You know, when, you, when you're waiting on a baby to come, the closer and closer you get to the due date, what happens? If you're not anticipating it very much when you first learn she's pregnant. When you, you know it's not time yet, right? But as time goes on, the anticipation goes up and it goes up and it goes up. And before very long, you're just, you're just waiting. It. And then before very long, Raphael doesn't get out of, the, out of the length of his phone because, you know, she was coming and he was waiting on the call, Right? Um, you, you, you become more and more excited. You become more anxious, maybe even. You, you become more expectant. Every time the phone rings, eventually you're thinking, oh, is that, right? oh, no, it's not her. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the, in fact, I have, and, and, and as we look at this, we, we, we recognize that the coming of that baby is, at first, it seems like a long delay, right? Fill this in. Um, Jesus is, I'm coming. Here's what we know, though, about it. And as we think about it in, the, in terms of birth, because that's part of what Jesus had talked about, his delay will be long. Um, that's part of the picture. We have even seen in Scripture that, you know, how long the mom waits for that baby to be born, but it seems like a long time. How many of you women that have had baby? I don't know this, but I just heard y'all. How many of you just said, man, this is taking so long? Especially if you're like coming up on full pregnancy, I mean, not full pregnant when you're pregnant or not, uh, toward full term um, in the summer months, right? I've heard you guys complain about the summer. How many of you had a baby in the summer or near the summer? So hot, especially South Florida, right? And it's just hot and you're just thinking, golly, how long, oh Lord. It, it's a long delay. But then we also see in the scripture, his return will be sudden. It, it, it happens. This is clearly throughout the scripture. It's going to be sudden. And we also see that when he comes, it is going to be irreversible. I mean, you can't, no, put it back in. No, it's, you know, the baby is born. He is coming. Um, and when that happens, our hearts are going to be exposed. Now, I just, I think about these so far and I, I, Think about the last one. All of these, we, we can just go to various scriptures where we see indication of this. But this next one is a very serious one. Our sentence at his coming may be surprising. I want you to see Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Jesus said this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, underline it, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, this is indicating that at the anticipated return of Christ, some are going to be astonished. I, I got to be honest with you, that, that really burdens me. Many times as I've read that and I've said, well, Lord, am I, 
Am I truly yours? I know there's things that I deal with and there's sin in my heart and I know that I'm I disappoint others and I disappoint myself. Am I yours? And there are going to be some who've not thought very deeply about this and not listened very carefully to these passages. And they've gone down the road of religion. And they've looked good and they've smelled good and they've acted good. And on the day of their reckoning, they are going to be astonished to hear a booming voice say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because they were depending upon religion and not upon the blood of the Savior. Now the Bible is very clear that those who are his children can know that they know that they know that they are his. But the Bible also says, be careful and test yourself. See that you're not deceived. Come down before your God and truly evaluate. And these are sober words that would be very good on a Wednesday night as we're studying the return of Christ to recognize this. And I would call you to really look at that. I believe that there are many, I, I think about all the people that come on Sunday mornings to our church and even Wednesday night in a crowd like this that, that the Lord is very serious about us and we need to be very serious about him when it comes to are we truly believing and trusting upon what he has said to believe and trust upon. You see, our lives, fill this in, will stand alone. In all of the description of this, it's never referenced in a plurality um, of you standing before God as a group. Whenever we see the picture of a, a soul before God, it is you and God um, before a people. In fact, pastors, the idea is I'm, I'm not going to be judged with the whole group of Sheridan Hills. In fact, there's a couple of different places where we see that those who are spiritual leaders are going to even endure a stricter judgment over what they teach and who they are and what they proclaim to be. And so it doesn't say that I get to hide behind you in that. It's that I will stand before God um, in this, and you will stand before God. You can't hide behind your godly mother or your praying grandmother or your uncle preacher, or your grandfather who was a pastor. It is you before God. We not only must anticipate the coming of Christ in a very real way, and we must also be prepared. Bottom of page 42 indicates this question. Are you keeping watch for Christ? We see numerous places in Scripture where we are expected to anticipate and to keep watch for the return of Christ. Look at the bottom of page 42. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was, gave me no food and no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick and in prison and did not minister to you? They simply did not recognize and wait with eagerness. This was, this was part of that waiting for him was that they were living out the call of Christ to be what he had called them to be. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. That this is a sudden event. Now, if you knew that the thief was headed to your house tonight, what would you do? Would you brush your teeth? Go check your email one more time. Saunder off to bed. Lay down. Read your Bible. Pray with your wife. And say, well, let's just go to sleep. Is that what you would do if you knew the thief was coming tonight? You'd, you'd wake up, you'd prepare, you'd load that sucker. You, know, you, know, you, you'd, you would be ready for that thief, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're thinking, sorry. Um, you, you would, I mean, 
You wouldn't go, you would wait with anticipation of what was happening. We are told he is coming and he's coming like, and and the picture is, is that we need to be vigilant. We need to, in our heart, be ready. This is the language throughout we see even tonight. This is one of the big, just overarching things that I want us to get tonight is that he has said that he's coming. He has said for us to anticipate it. He has said for us to watch for it. And we should live our lives in light of that. Look at 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will, be, will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Revelation 3.3. 3, Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go out naked and be seen exposed. Now, there's big spiritual language right there in 1615. That you put on Christ and you keep Christ on because that is your readiness for the return of Christ. That you are in Christ. You are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And it would not be correct And we would say, if you're truly in Christ, you are not going to take off that rope of the righteousness of Christ and live your life and be caught unawares in this. I remember when I was at South Broward High School, I had Coach Griffin. And I don't know if Lolly is here tonight. Lolly, are you here? Um, Lolly, do you remember Coach Griffin from Georgia? You remember him? Do you know what I'm about to say? Okay. Okay. He would stand us all out there in the athletic field at South Broward High School. And he was a Georgia African-American guy. And he'd say, I want to have a little talk with you. I've been teaching you all basketball. I've been teaching you soccer. But the most important lesson I could ever teach you is that you not be caught with your pants down. Do you remember that? I could, he would say, the Lord is coming from the east and he will have come at an hour that you do not know. You cannot get ready. It will be too late. Don't you get caught with your pants down. He would preach the gospel. And I, I remember just being blown away by that. He moved away to Georgia. It was one of the greatest losses. He moved away when they no longer required P.E. for all four years. He said, y'all don't want P.E.? I'll go where they want P.E. <laughs> moved back to Georgia. But that's what he was talking about. And Coach Griffin, he, he knew. Is that inspiring to you? Oh, sorry. Notice this with me as well. Um, Are you faithfully following Christ? What do we do now? What we're supposed to do now is faithfully follow Christ. Matthew 24. Look what it says. Who then is faithful and wise servant? whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Can you underline that? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to him, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards and the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that day, 
there will be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Let me tell you, Jesus was incapable of sissy talk. Jesus spoke in the boldest and clearest of terms. And when he talked about coming back, it was very, very clear and stark. He was saying, you don't mess around if you're my child. You live like you're my child right up to when I come. And either death will come to you or I will come to you and you'll not be ashamed. Notice this. We go on. Matthew 25 um, talks about this and the, the glorious picture of that. But fill this in on the next page, top of page 44. The kingdom of heaven is not, circle the word not, the kingdom of heaven is not for those who respond to an invitation, make a confession, or express some affection. I could put out there to the side, fill out a card. How about this? Go through starting point. Starting point doesn't save you. But the kingdom of heaven is for those who, very important, endure in salvation. Amen. This is the belief in the perseverance of the saints is the doctrine that we call that. It's that if you're saved, that you endure in that salvation in Christ. And that is something that God does through us. But this is a, is a very, very key thing for us to recognize. So are we faithfully following Christ? That's what that one is. Are we faithfully following Christ? How about the next one? Are you serving Christ with what he has given you? Now, this whole section that you see, this the, the long scripture that is here, is the parable of the stewards. The parable of the talents, where, where God invests this in them. And then some of them take these talents and use them, and some of them bury these talents. Some of them are unfaithful in this. You see, look at the bottom. Jesus is our master, and we are his stewards. He has given us the stewardship of life. Stewardship doesn't only refer to money. It refers to all that God has given you. Every talent, every resource, every ability. Listen to this, your time. And so what do you do with your life? He, the master has given you this life and you are either living this life as a good steward or a bad steward. You're either spending it on the things that don't matter or you're spending it on the things that really do matter. If you're living your life for comfort and ease and vacation and retirement, my friend, you're very short-sighted. But if you are starting to see all of the value of your life has been given for a very short time for an eternal reward and an eternal impact, now you're talking. What do I do with my days? What do I do with my job? What do I do with my family? What do I do with the, the abilities that God has given me? Are they being used for something besides just me? Christ calls us to live like that. He calls us to see that he is the master, that we are the steward of what he's given. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't ever go on vacation. That doesn't mean that you can't have a nice thing. That doesn't mean that you can't relax and take a bubble bath. I mean, all, I mean it, that's all part of living life in balance and for his glory. But the ultimate question is, is it just for you? Or is it ultimately, are you going on vacation for his glory? Are you going on um, the the things that he's given you and using them for his glory. That's what we're called to do. It's to see our whole life as a stewardship of his generosity and his goodness and his mission. Will you be commended in your love for Christ? Will you be commended in your love for Christ? Or will you be condemned for your laziness before Christ? Because if you read that parable... That's exactly what happens. One servant is told, well done, my good and faithful service. And then the other one is said, you wicked servant. You took what I gave you and you buried it. 
You, you lived in fear instead of in faith. So he's saying that we are not to live in laziness before the Lord. Well, not only are you serving Christ, that's the one up there above us, but what about this one? Are you serving Christians that God has put around you? Because that is what we see over and over and over again through the New Testament, that we are called to be serving in Him. Look at Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, top of page 45, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, and then He will sit on His glorious throne, before Him will be gathered all the nations and He will separate one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, come, come. You who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then there were righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when... Did, you, did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the Lord will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it unto the least of my brothers, you did it to me. This is a big picture about God's people serving. And then we see that he says to those on his left, Look what it says there. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. And, and you know, we've already read that section in another portion. And he said, but you, you will be cut off from me because you did not serve Christ, and you did not serve others. This is the way of Christ. Now, here's the idea. We don't serve, notice this right there in the middle of page 45, we don't serve others not because you want to get into heaven, but we, we do so because Jesus has changed your heart. That's the reason that we do it. We often put it like this. I say, I don't seek to do what is right and serve others because I want to be saved. I do what is right because what? I am saved. Very good. It's not because I want to be saved. It's because I am saved. This is how a Christian acts. This is what a Christian does. So notice this, and and notice it's sacrificial service. Sacrificial service is not a means of earning salvation. Sacrificial service is necessary evidence of salvation. You're not earning it. You're simply showing it. You're simply exemplifying it. It is evidence of our salvation. There's three things here as we end. In the end, His coming, His coming, His timing as He comes will confound our wisdom. That simply means, you all, we do not know when He is coming again. That is the bottom line of what we've studied. We've seen it over and over again. Jesus makes clear, no man knows the hour. The angels do not know the hour. And that's an important thing for us to remember because there are people on the radio and they're on television and they've bought printing presses and they are seeking to work it all out and tell you exactly when Jesus is coming again. And every time you hear that, you need to start to realize this is not to be listened to. Many Christians have been made fools of because somebody was wise enough to quote-unquote figure out when Jesus was coming. And this is saying, this is going to confound our wisdom. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 makes that so very clear. The second thing I want you to see here is his church, and this is our lives, his church will accomplish his mission. We are going to fulfill what he said. We are going to do it. And I love this. In Matthew 24, look what it says. And the gospel of the kingdom will be, underline that, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, 
and then the end will come. You say, golly, missions is so hard. It seems like there's so many lost people. We look at the billion in India, the billion in China. We look at the, the massive lostness in various places of the world. When is this ever going to be fulfilled? Well, take heart. Jesus said it's going to be accomplished. So let's just go do it. We don't give up because it looks so ominous. We, you know, we have friends that, that live amongst, in cities with millions and millions and millions of people and very few believers. And many of them could lose heart except for this verse that says to them, it's going to be accomplished. Keep going. Keep learning that language. Keep getting ready to get the gospel into that, into that place that seems so hard. You know, we have missionaries that can't even get to their people because the places are so messed up. They, they have political problems or they have cultural issues that are very hot right now. Um, there's other things that are happening. There's, there's, there's physical things that are in the way of this. And we have IMB missionaries and other missionaries, but a lot of IMB missionaries that are, are really studying and preparing to get the gospel into that last unreached people group, that last place all the, low pick, all the fruit that's hanging low has already been picked. Now you've got to get up there high in the hard part of the tree to get to it. That's what we're doing now. But it, we can be encouraged that God is saying, my mission is going to be accomplished. Look at what George Ladd says. I love this. Um, right there in the middle of the page. God alone knows the de definition of the terms. I cannot precisely define who all the nations are, but I do not need to know. I know only one thing. Christ has not yet returned, therefore the task is not done. When it is done, Christ will come. Our responsibility is not to insist on the defining, uh, on defining the terms. Our, underline this. Our responsibility is to complete the task. So long as Christ does not return, our work is, not, is undone. Let us get busy and complete our mission. That's why you need to be involved with the Great Commission. That's why you need to be praying for unreached people groups. That's why you need to be giving sacrificially. That's why some of you need to be saying, Lord, I'll go. I'll go. And I'll stay until the job is done. God has called us to serve him with no strings attached to complete the mission. And he said that he will reward those who labor in his harvest. Look at the last one there. So we've said his timing will confound our, our wisdom. His church uh, will complete his mission. He's going to do it through us. And then look at the last one. His return will exceed our expectations. His return will exceed our expectations. Don't pack up. Just look at this. Look what, look what it says. He is going to fulfill every hope and every expectation. Look what it says. Oh, Lord, come. What a great verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Oh, Lord, come. Look at the next one. Revelation 22 and verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, just look right here for a second. Have you ever really, really looked forward to something? I mean, you were getting ready for it. You were anticipating it. Maybe it was a vacation. Maybe it was getting into a house. Maybe it was going shopping and getting this thing. Whatever it was, maybe it was a long, maybe it was retirement. You, you're just working away. You're looking forward to it. You're planning it. You're getting ready. It's just, it's been so wonderful. You're, all of those things there. And then finally... You get it. And somehow, it wasn't that great. I have bought stuff. And I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it, planned, read research and everything else. And then you find, you get all excited. You know, March, I think we can go get it. And so you, you go get it, and you come home, and you sit there and you look at it. It's not so great. How many times have we been a little disappointed by something we anticipated? That is not what's going to happen with this one. The coming of Christ is going to so blow your mind and so blow your heart and so fulfill every aspect of your being 
that you will rejoice in his coming as you have anticipated it, and it's going to be beyond all of your wildest expectations. Now, friends, we need to remember the glory of the king. And if we ever can look at the language of the Bible and see the glory of our God, and you look through a microscope or you look through a telescope and you see the grandeur of God and the things that he has prepared, and the Bible tells us that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that he has planned. So do you love him? Do you anticipate his coming? You will not be disappointed. Amen? Let's stand together as we go. Holy Father, I pray that you would protect us from standing right now after sitting for a while and a long day and hearing some teaching and, and just kind of go, oh, that was nice. I pray that you would help us to evaluate our lives, even right now. Do we live in light of what your word has said about all of eternity? Do you?